the Sultanate of Women, Norbanu and Sophia. Through most of history, queens have been kept out of power politics. Their jobs were to produce sons who might one day rule, daughters who could be traded in dynastic marriages, and to leave the ruling up to their husbands. Of course, traditional gender roles never stopped clever and ambitious women from claiming power where and when they could. Things were the same in the Ottoman Empire, where the Sultan kept a harem of hundreds of enslaved concubines, captured from all over the empire to bear his children. But from 1533 to 1656, a handful of remarkable women bent the harem system to their wills and exercised extraordinary political influence and power. This period is known as the Sultanate of Women. Let's meet the women who rose from sexual slavery to rule the Ottoman Empire. Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent lived up to his name. He expanded the Ottoman Empire's territory and power extensively during his 45-year reign. His favorite concubine, Horem, became so important to him that he broke with convention, shocked everyone, and married her. He made her his empress and most trusted advisor. Hurem amassed extensive political power and influence, a feat unheard of for a woman, and she was resented for it. Her daughter, Mirhima, was married to the Grand Vizier and also wielded considerable influence. I've made a video all about Hurem Sultan, which I will link in the description. In this video, we'll focus on her daughter-in-law and the other women who built on her legacy to claim and hold even more power from within the harem. Hurem died in 1558, and her sultan, Suleiman, mourned her for the next eight years until he joined her in death. The sultans that followed him were unable to fill his shoes. The resulting power vacuum allowed even more opportunity for women to take charge in politics. And a deadly tradition forced them to fight fiercely for the lives of their precious sons. According to Ottoman succession law, any of the Sultan's sons could succeed him, not just the eldest. But multiple sons almost inevitably led to civil war. Thus, it had long been the practice for the son who successfully took the throne to have all of his brothers murdered. Suleiman and Hurem had two sons who survived them, Salim and Bayezid. The brothers went to war, Salim won and became sultan, and Bayezid was executed. Sultan Salim II had the hundreds of women of the harem at his beck and call, but much like his father, he was inclined towards monogamy and preferred to remain faithful to his favorite concubine, Nurbanu. She was the illegitimate child of two Venetian nobles. Her birth name was Cecilia Venier Bafo, and she may have been of Jewish descent. At the age of 12, she was captured by an Ottoman admiral during one of the ongoing wars between the empire and the powerful Italian city-state. She was taken to Istanbul and presented to Salem while he was still a prince and about the same age as her. Prince Salem fell deeply in love with a beautiful and intelligent concubine who was given the new Turkish name Nurbanu, meaning Princess of Light. Per tradition, the prince was sent to the provinces to learn how to govern, and he took Nurbanu with him on his travels. He remained faithful to her, and they had five children together, four daughters but only one son, Murad. When his father died, Salem returned to Istanbul to claim the throne. As sultan, he was far from magnificent. He was an alcoholic and preferred to leave the running of the government to his grand vizier, with a good deal of influence from Norbanu. Other nobles attempted to claim the throne from the weak sultan, but none succeeded, and when the rebels were captured and put to death, their families were massacred along with them to prevent further challenges. 
Salim made clear his love and devotion to Norbanu publicly, legally marrying her and proclaiming their son Murad his heir. But child mortality was high and only having one heir to the throne was very risky. If anything should happen to Murad, the empire would be plunged into chaos. In order to add some insurance to secure the Osman dynasty, Salem reluctantly went to bed with other concubines and produced a handful of spare sons. But these children presented a threat to Norbanu's son, and everyone knew that in the likely event that they weren't needed as sultan, they would be strangled with a bowstring. After eight years on the throne, Salim suffered a rather unfortunate accident. Drunk and stumbling about in the bathhouse, he slipped and fell, hitting his head on the marble floor and dying instantly. The death of a sultan was a crisis. Usually his sons, their mothers, and their supporters would prepare to fight to the death over the throne. Norbanu's son, 28-year-old Prince Murad, was away in the provinces. But the fact that the sultan had died inside the harem, the space in which Norbanu had absolute control, gave her an advantage. The wily consort ordered everyone who knew of her husband's demise to keep their mouths shut on pain of death. She stored Salem's body in the ice house and called Murad to return to the capital post haste. Once the prince arrived, he went straight to his mother, and although he was loath to do so, she insisted that he carry out his duty and have his five young half brothers killed. It was a night of terror in the harem. The next morning, the people saw the first sign that they had a new sultan. Five coffins being carried out of the palace. The prince's five mothers were devastated, and one of them committed suicide. Nurbanu had succeeded in making her son the uncontested sultan. She was the first woman to use the title Valid Sultan, Queen Mother. In this new role, she had even more power than she had had as a royal consort. She held considerable influence over her son and was his most trusted advisor. And she had better success molding his career. Sultan Murad III was far more respected and beloved by his people than his father had ever been. Though she was unable to leave the harem, and the sultan got all the glory, insiders knew who the real mover and shaker was. The Venetian ambassador wrote that all good and all ill come through the queen mother. She corresponded with Catherine de' Medici, queen of France. And now, back to royal history. But Norbanu soon had a rival, her son's new favorite, Safiya. She had been captured in Albania or Bosnia and brought to the imperial harem at the age of 13. Her name means the pure one, and she gave birth to Murad's first son, Mahmed. Murad took after his father and grandfather in his preference for monogamy and remained faithful to Safiya. By the time he became a sultan, his only son was 15, and he hadn't produced any other heirs. Safiya tried to exercise political influence over her sultan, but he wasn't interested in hearing any woman's advice save his mother's. Norbanu chided her son for failing to sleep with more concubines and produce more sons. The queen mother accused Safiya of using witchcraft to cause the sultan to be impotent with all other women. And the consort's servants were tortured for evidence, but none was found. Norbanu put many beautiful women in her son's path, in the hopes that they might seduce him away from Safiya. She sent dancing girls to entertain him, but his head wasn't turned until his sister presented him with the gift of two concubines. Though reluctant at first, the sultan was soon enticed. He pushed Safiya aside and went to bed with hundreds of concubines. He even began sleeping in the harem, much to the horror of his male courtiers. 
though initially hurt, Safiya realized that there was little she could do to stem the Sultan's lust. She maintained her dignity and even procured more beautiful women for the Sultan to sleep with, who would be loyal to her. The Queen Mother encouraged her son's sexual exploits. With him busy in the harem and under her nose, rather than on military campaign on the other side of the empire, she had far more influence on him and on the running of the state. Even without the Sultan heading up the army, the Ottoman Empire continued to grow. It reached its height during Murad's reign, from Iran in the east to Budapest in the west. Likewise, the harem was extensively expanded and reached its zenith. A sumptuous suite of 20 rooms were constructed for the Queen Mother herself, and a window was built between the harem and the Imperial Council's meeting room, from which Norbanu could overhear all the goings-on of the council. She was the power behind the throne, but she still wasn't allowed outside the harem. More and more women were brought in to please the Sultan. There had been 150 concubines under Suleiman the Magnificent, but under Murad there were 600. Not all of these women were sleeping with the Sultan. While the most beautiful were selected for reproductive duties, many of the women were part of the large administrative hierarchy. There were dozens of jobs that needed to be done to keep the luxurious harem running. Roles for the women included mistress of dressmaking, mistress of jewels, mistress of coffee, mistress of sherbet, mistress of laundry, and mistress of housekeeping. And each had her own staff. Few outsiders were ever allowed to enter the gilded cage of the harem. The exceptions were midwives, who were allowed in to deliver babies. They advised the women on other matters of health and on contraception. Midwives prepared pessaries made of wool and coated in oil, herbs, and honey for various women in the harem. But concubines were not likely to try and prevent a pregnancy that might bring them honor and status if they were lucky enough to be selected for a night with the Sultan. Therefore, these contraceptives were most likely prepared for use with the only other men allowed in the harem, eunuchs. In order to ensure that only the Sultan was fathering children with his concubines, the harem was guarded by eunuchs, men who had been castrated. Some of these men were clean-shaven, meaning that all of their reproductive organs were cut off. They carried silver quills in their turbans, which were used to urinate. But, in many cases, their testes were twisted and crushed rather than removed, and many of these men later regained sexual function. There are multiple accounts of eunuchs having secret relationships with the women of the harem. To further ensure that the Sultan would not be cuckolded, all of the eunuchs were dark-skinned Africans. So it would be clear if a concubine gave birth to the child of a eunuch, and the woman would have been very careful to prevent such a pregnancy. The eunuchs were the only dwellers of the harem who were allowed to leave at will and move freely in the rest of the palace. Therefore, they became invaluable to Norbanu and any other women who wished to influence life and politics outside of the harem. They were able to report goings-on to the women they were allied with and carry messages back outside the harem. They facilitated relationships with statesmen and acted as go-betweens for women to patronize charities and building projects. Norbanu was paid a lavish allowance by her son, and she used her money to build several mosques, advertising her power outside the harem where she herself could never set foot. Norbanu played peacekeeper between her son Murad and her grandson Mahmed, both of whom she loved dearly. The father and son fought so bitterly that Norbanu feared her son would order his son's execution. Mahmed once slept with one of his father's concubines, a forbidden act akin to incest, and got the woman pregnant. 
to cover up the event and prevent further quarreling, nor Banu had the woman killed. The Queen Mother never forgot her Venetian roots and employed a spy to keep her up to date on the many intrigues between Venice and the Ottomans. This bias towards the empire's enemy caused many to dislike Norbanu, and it was whispered that she was poisoned because of it. At the height of her power, aged 58, she died suddenly. Her son ignored tradition, which dictated that a sultan must not attend the funeral of a woman. He walked in front of his mother's coffin, openly weeping. She was buried next to Sultan Selim II in the imperial mausoleum of the Hagia Sophia, thus becoming the first wife to be laid to rest next to her sultan. Without his mother, Murad soon turned to the advice of his first love, Safiya, the mother of his eldest son. But concern was growing that the sultan had fathered far too many sons. Previous sultans took pains to ensure that they only sired an heir and a few spares, but in his lust, Murad overdid it. It was said that a hundred cradles were being rocked in the harem at one time. When Sultan Murad died, he had 27 daughters and 20 sons. The eldest, Mahmed, immediately ordered all 19 of his brothers strangled. If five small coffins had saddened and angered the people, 19 horrified and infuriated them. It was said that the angels in heaven wept when they saw the terrible sight. The public outcry helped to end the practice of sultans killing their brothers. As the new queen mother, Safiya influenced her son and enriched herself. Her allowance of 300 aspers a day was the highest ever paid to a woman. Safiya was a key player in foreign policy. She continued Norbanu's pro-Venetian approach and struck up a friendship via post with Queen Elizabeth I of England. The queens exchanged gifts. Safiya sent cloth of silver and a girdle of gold, and Elizabeth sent a portrait of herself. Safiya enjoyed making incognito trips outside of the harem and into town in a covered carriage, which was considered extremely scandalous. While sultans won popularity by waging war and expanding the empire, sultanas were forbidden to leave the gilded cage of the harem. Instead, they courted the love of their people through charitable donations and public works, particularly the building of mosques. Safiya started the construction of the Yini Mosque, also known as the Valid Sultan or Queen Mother Mosque. But like her predecessors, she had to contend with her own son's favorites. Handan from Bosnia was presented to Prince Mahmed as a gift during his time governing the provinces. She was the love of his youth, and he favored her above other concubines. She gave birth to three sons and two daughters. Queen Mother Safiya resented Handan, shunned her, and encouraged her son to spend time with other women. Mahmed was far from a one-woman man and eventually moved on to other favorites, including Halime, who was of Abkhazian origin. She bore the Sultan two sons, Mahmud and Mustafa. As they grew into teenagers, she became increasingly anxious about their futures. Prince Mahmud was extremely popular with the people and was poised to become a powerful rival to his brothers and even his father. Halime wrote to a religious seer, asking for a vision of her son's fate. But the return message was intercepted by a eunuch in Safiya's confidence. The prophecy foretold that Sultan Mahmed would die within six months, but didn't say what would become of Prince Mahmud. Safiya shared the prophecy with her own son, and both were incensed at the prediction of his death. They had Prince Mahmud interrogated, but he knew nothing of his mother's request for a prophecy. 
But all the same, the Sultan had his own teenage son strangled in his sleep by four mutes. The Sultan waited outside the door while the deed was done, and then went in to make sure his child was dead. For good measure, he had the prince's supporters thrown into the sea. Halime was banished from the harem and sent to live in the old Eski Palace called the Palace of Tears, which housed the concubines of dead sultans. But the prophecy did indeed come true. Prince Mahmud was put to death in June of 1608, and by December, Sultan Mahmed was dead. Some say the 37-year-old sultan died because of the stress of murdering his own son. Others, that it was the plague that did him in. His eldest son, 13-year-old Ahmed I, became sultan. The new queen mother, Hadan, took power in the harem, and her son provided her a generous allowance. He honored the nobles who had gifted his mother to his father for bringing his parents together. The young sultan had always begrudged his grandmother Safiya's ill treatment of his mother, and one of his first acts was to banish Safiya to the Palace of Tears, thus ending her 19-year reign of power. She lived in luxurious retirement for another 26 years, dying at the age of 71. Sultan Ahmed I had several brothers to contend with. But after the horror of his father's ascension, the people wouldn't stand for another round of fratricide. Instead, he locked his brothers away in the kafis, or cage. Much like the harem, these beautiful apartments were a gilded cage. But unlike the harem, there was almost no communication with the outside world. Princes spent their lives there, never knowing if they would be pulled out and suddenly made sultan, or be strangled to death in their sleep. As the new sultan was still only a boy, his mother and his tutor acted as his co-regents. Handan advised her son on the appointments of several prominent government officials, favoring her own countrymen, Bosnians. But the man she favored for Grand Vizier turned on her son and joined a rebellion. He was executed and the stress caused the Queen Mother, already suffering from chronic illness, to die. Without the advice of his mother, the young Sultan wavered in the sea of politics. But his new favorite concubine, the beautiful, intelligent, and cunning Qasim Sultan, soon took the helm. Captured in Greece and sold into slavery, she would rise to become the most powerful woman in the history of the Sultanate of Women. Her reign of power, both benevolent and ruthless, would span the tenure of no less than six sultans. While her male relatives battled with each other over the throne and behaved very badly indeed, Qasim Sultan kept the empire running until yet another young rival emerged to bring her to a bloody end. In next week's video, we'll meet Qasim Sultan and complete the story of the Sultanate of Women. Don't want to wait to see the next episode? Patrons get exclusive early access to almost all of my multi-part series on Patreon early. If you would like to become a patron and help me make more fascinating history videos, check out the link in the description. Thank you for watching.